Howdy, everyone. Welcome to the next session. I want to introduce to you Ian Smith. This is a man who uh, has stood up to tyrants in his state. You know I love that. They tried to shut down his gym. They tried to shut down his employees and tried to shut down him. But he wasn't having any of it, and he stood right back up. And his story inspired a lot of people, even in Texas, to not shut their businesses. So he's had a, he has a wide national effect. He's also very knowledgeable about globalism and the effects of globalism on masculinity and the family. And he sports an Odin beard worthy of any frost giant killer. Good afternoon. I am very happy to be here uh, for my second year at the 21 convention. Um, last year, I spoke amidst the COVID quote unquote crisis um, and in the middle of a very nasty and, uh, and lengthy battle with the entire state government of New Jersey. Um, I gained notoriety two and a half years ago on the national stage because <clears throat> Somebody came along into my life uh, and told me that I wasn't allowed to provide for my family. I wasn't allowed to do my service, which I'm extremely passionate about, uh, to the community. And uh, basically told me that everything that I hold of value and all value that I can provide was no longer needed, wasn't necessary. Uh, my business partner and I decided that we were going to reopen our gym and, uh, well, I guess the rest is history. And I've come today to share with you uh, some of the things that I've learned along the way. What we did two and a half years ago was probably one of the most proud moments of my life, one of the biggest accomplishments that I've ever had as a young man. Uh, however, before I tell you about that, before I tell you about the lessons I've learned, I'd like to also tell you about my greatest failures as a man and my darkest moments as a man, because this isn't a highlight reel. Um, and I'm by no means a perfect man, um, in fact, far from it. But I am a trying man, and I am a growing man. And I think that that's an important thing for all of us to remember today. And I hope that after I tell you the stories of how I wound up here, that I can leave you with a lesson or two and maybe answer some questions for you um, about masculinity and what it looks like in today's modern world. And it's a question that I only began to ask and be asked two and a half years ago when I decided that I wasn't going to close my gym. So once again, my name is Ian Smith. Uh, pretty regular childhood. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was raised by a single mother who did her absolute best. Uh, to raise me well. She did a pretty good job, but I think as all of us here in the crowd and everybody watching understands that uh, you can't raise a man being a woman, that there's something else missing. As I was growing up, I always looked around for some sort of example, how to be a man. And I started to form my identity. And <clears throat> I decided that I wanted to be tough. But I didn't know what that meant. I decided that I wanted to be strong. I didn't know what that meant. I decided that I was opinionated and that I had strong beliefs, but I didn't know how to express them. So as a young teenager, uh, I grew wild, I grew restless and reckless. When I was in college, 19 years old, 20 years old, excuse me, uh, I was a hard partier. Um, had no respect for anybody, authority, uh, good or bad. Um, I didn't really have a set of values, only what served me best in that moment. Uh, I was good at getting what I wanted, um, and that usually meant stepping over or on people to do so, something I'm not proud of. Um, always got my way one way or another, and, um, and it eventually wound me up in, uh, in a lot of trouble. In April of 2007, I woke after a night, uh, a very typical night at college. I didn't leave the campus that night. Uh, looked like 
any other normal college night for a kid who lives on campus, 20 years old, having everything paid for them, student loans, uh, barely focusing on school, doing the bare minimum to get by, trying to make, make, make the most of that time there. Um, drank in excess. What was uh, considered normal for me was definitely in excess looking back at it. And I went to sleep that night. <clears throat> the next morning I awoke in a hurry, late to work. Didn't really have a real job. I uh, was doing something for my parents. Um, woke up with about a half hour to get there, and it took about an hour to get there. So woke up in a rush. It was the end of the uh, school year, so I threw some stuff into my car. I got in it, and I just started barreling towards my destination. About 20 minutes later, um, I became the sole reason for an automobile accident in which took the life of a 20-year-old man. Barreled through a stop sign going well in excess of the speed limit, um, well in excess of what was posted and well in excess of what was even reasonable. Why? Because I was a selfish asshole and I didn't really care about anybody else in the world around me. I just needed to get to where I was going. Blew a stop sign and T-boned that young man. He was dead on sight. Um, I remember the accident very vividly. And it's probably something I'll never forget. I came to uh, after the collision and <clears throat> didn't really know what happened. I still remember the song that was playing on the radio, it was skipping. And um, I was looking around, and there was a, a big gash across my forehead. And the first thing that led me to realize something was terribly wrong uh, was blood dripping down uh, over my eyes so that I couldn't see. And I ran my tongue across the front of my mouth, felt several teeth missing. And in that moment, I realized that it was serious. Hopped out of the car and uh, ran over to the other vehicle. What I saw was the worst thing that I've ever done. I saw a young man trapped in a vehicle that had collapsed on him uh, with absolutely no chance of helping him. Fast forward, went to the hospital. For some reason or another, I sustained minor injuries, a couple missing teeth, a lot of glass in my forehead, but I was otherwise okay. Still smelled like alcohol, because I had drank so much the night before that it was pouring out of my pores, um, and there was still alcohol present in my system. So not only did I do something terrible and make a huge mistake, I looked like a genuine piece of shit in the process. Nine o'clock in the morning, and I still had a above the legal limit uh, blood alcohol level. The next weeks go by and trying to deal with this, feeling bad for myself, asking why, how did this happen, how did I not see it coming, why didn't I just roll over and go back to bed that night or, or that morning. And um, you know, the only way I can describe how I felt in those couple weeks afterwards, my phone would ring and it wouldn't even elicit a response. I wouldn't even look to see who was calling. I was just there, um, trapped in my head, reliving those moments, and um, being in a place of hopelessness and hatred for oneself. My mom came up with the idea, she's a public school teacher, or was, that I should speak about what happened and I didn't want to do it. But being the selfish asshole that I was at the time, she said, you know what? It might look good for your sentencing. So I said, OK. I went. They put me up in an auditorium full of 500 kids. Had no idea what I was going to say. Um, I just got up there, and I told my story. And um, afterwards, uh, the principal of school came up to me, and he said, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never seen an auditorium full of high schoolers dead quiet. So I've done auditoriums for years and years and years. I mean, I've done uh, presentations for years and years and years for these kids. And he said, you captivated them. Do you mind if I give your number to some of my colleagues? I said, sure. Wound up speaking at 25 schools before I was sentenced to five and a half years in prison. 
And um, right before I was sentenced, it's a very strange feeling when you know you're going away. There's this sort of ticking clock over your head. Um, feels like very hard to stay motivated, to stay focused, uh, to even give a shit. You know, I had already felt bad enough about what I did, um, and now it kind of seemed like my life was over too. 20 years old, uh, facing down 10 years in prison for what was totally something that I never meant to do that was an accident that if I could change places with that young man, I would. Didn't matter though, justice had to be served. And um, <clears throat> a couple weeks before I went away, never slept very well. I would sleep a couple hours a night no matter what I did. I'd always relive that scene of getting out of my vehicle, walking up to the other vehicle and seeing a, a young man trapped, dead. <clears throat> I went into the mirror, or excuse, me, excuse me, I went into the bathroom and uh, it was wee hours in the morning and I remember kind of having a moment where I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and I was still, still pretty banged up. Uh, I looked like Two-Face, kind of from Batman. I had hit the windshield with one side of my face so I had all these scars and cuts all over it and I was missing teeth on this side, but pretty normal looking on the other side. And I, I looked at myself and I actually started to laugh um, because I thought, look at you, you fool. Look at what you've done. Look at what your arrogance and your selfishness um, <clears throat> and your lack of concern has done. You thought you were tough. You thought you could handle the world by yourself. You thought you had all the answers. You thought you were invincible. Now you have nothing. Your life will go nowhere and you look like a fool. In that moment, <clears throat> I remember thinking to myself, what now? Where do I go from here? What do I do? How do I make this better? Can I make this better? Should I even try? And <clears throat> I sat there looking at myself for a while, and I came to the conclusion that not only should I change my life, um, I had a responsibility and a duty to do so. I had a responsibility to the young man who was killed because of my, of my recklessness and carelessness. And if I didn't strive to be a better man, and if I didn't strive to somehow repent from my sins, that um, that, that would be an insult to the young man who passed away and an insult to his family and to everybody that I hurt by doing what I did. So I resolved then and there that I would figure it out. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't even know who I wanted to become, what my values were, or how to get there. Fast forward, <clears throat> 21 years old, the gavel bangs. I'm sentenced to five and a half years in state prison. I uh, <clears throat> don't remember a whole lot that day, a lot of crying. Um, it's kind of like being at your own funeral. You're, you're surrounded by family and uh, nobody really knows what to say. It's not a whole lot to say. Um, people are just trying to be there for you. And um, <clears throat> before my sentencing, a family member of the young man who passed away came up to me outside of the courtroom and said to me, are you Ian? And I said, yes. She handed me a card and she walked away. I opened up that card and in it just said, we don't hate you, we hate what you did. And I remember feeling a huge weight lifted off of my shoulders because that was forgiveness like I've never experienced. And, um, and I felt an even greater sense of responsibility moving forward because somebody had 
given me that gift. Um, that probably wasn't very easy for that person to write and to say. So the gavel bangs. <clears throat> I hear my mom scream as I'm sort of ripped away from her. Um, and off I go. 21 years old. Uh, <clears throat> kid from the suburbs who's pretended like he was tough his whole life, but really wasn't. Um, getting thrown in with the big dogs in, uh, in one of the roughest county jails in Jersey. You know, and, uh, and that's never fun. You go in and <clears throat> you might get two shoes. One's probably the wrong size. Your pants are probably three times too big and they're still wet from whatever laundry uh, the prison offers. And you know, you're kind of sent into uh, this holding area and I was just trying to take it all in. And uh, I remember sitting there <clears throat> a couple days in and <laughs> it was actually a weekend. And I had made a friend in this older gentleman um, who was getting ready to, to serve 18 years. And I, I remember we were, we were playing cards and I, <laughs> I was like, man, that week went pretty quick. Like, that wasn't too bad. And, uh, and then I started to compute how many more weeks I had to do. Um, and I remember feeling like the walls were closing in uh, and I couldn't breathe and I started to just absolutely panic uh, because it was <laughs> hundreds um, compared to that one. <clears throat> so I was shipped off eventually to state prison and the first year was about learning how to survive. Um, prisons are little micro societies. They all operate a little bit differently depending on the demographic and who's in it uh, and what the, the ratio of um, groups are in there. And that was my first experience with tribalism. Um, I had never experienced it. You know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't a, in a fraternity in college. Uh, I wasn't a, uh, on sports teams or anything growing up. I didn't have that, that bond um, between men where you're willing to go to really, really far extents to protect each other and to make sure that not only are you okay, um, but that you're thriving as well. And I remember watching it all, watching the way different groups, gangs, races, religions, whatever way they were divided, how they would interact amongst each other and with each other. And I studied and I, and I just watched and watched and watched and watched. And eventually, uh, after many mistakes, <clears throat> um, annoying correctional officers was one. You know, I didn't have a pillow and I kept asking this guy for a fucking pillow. Uh, and eventually I wound up just with a knife under my mattress and in solitary confinement instead. Um, because nobody gives a shit about your comfort. Nobody gives a shit um, whether you're happy. You've been stripped of everything. Um, and in order to gain, in order to have anything, you have to gain respect first. You start at the bottom in prison. Um, and it took a while for me to understand that I was at the bottom because I was used to living a somewhat comfortable life. You know, I lived middle class life. I never really had to struggle that hard. I never really wanted anything that bad. I was never really deprived of anything um, to the point of discomfort and uh, hunger and, and all, of these, all of these feelings that I've never really felt before. Feeling alone, feeling desperate, uh, feeling completely powerless. Being told when you're going to eat, what you're going to eat, <laughs> how much you're going to eat. Uh, when you sleep, when you wake up, when the lights turn on, when the lights turn off, uh, where you can go, uh, who you can be around with, what you dress like, uh, what type of materials you can read, what type of television you can watch, what type of communication you can have with the outside world, um, you don't get anything. You have to earn all of it. So <clears throat> about a year in, sort of figured my way through things, and um, I was approached many times to join these different groups, and I just kept saying no, kept saying no, kept saying no. Eventually, I ran into a little bit of trouble with this particular group and uh, wound up in a little bit of a scuffle 
And because of that, I wound up in solitary confinement. Not a fun time. When you don't know who you are, being alone is a very scary thing. Very, very scary thing. Being alone and being unable to be distracted was one of the scariest things I've ever had to face down. Because I was 22 years old and I knew nothing about myself. I didn't know what my fears were. I didn't know what my dreams were. I didn't know what my values were. And everything that I thought I was was just sort of a projection. Um, there was not a whole lot of substance to it. I may have said things and acted certain ways, but I never lived any of these things. And I remember <clears throat> how loud the silence was and how intimidating it was. But I'm actually very thankful and grateful for the opportunity because I had to sit with myself for weeks with no contact, nothing to do. You're in a cell 24 hours a day. Uh, you might come out to make a phone call every three days for about 15 minutes. But other than that, it's 24 hours a day, just you and your thoughts. And uh, eventually, I started to use the time well. At first, I would just try to sleep because I was trying to be distracted, and I was trying to escape uh, because there, there was all these nagging questions that, were, that I could hear that I didn't want to answer, that I didn't want to address, um, or that I was too scared to even think about. And eventually, I got myself a pen and a paper, and I started to write some things down. I started to answer some of these questions, and I took the time to figure out what I wanted. What I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, and the mark that I wanted to leave on the world. And I realized in that moment that I hadn't left a good mark. The relationships that I had, the friendships that I had were shallow, were hollow, and I had burned a lot of bridges from, from the real people in my life um, in exchange for things that were attractive in the moment, that were shiny on the surface. <clears throat> and um, I figured out in those weeks a rough idea of who I wanted to be when this was over, who I wanted to walk out of those gates as, because I had four years left, or three years left, whatever it was. I was released <clears throat> back into general population, and uh, prison's a pretty boring place overall. You know, it's, uh, it's everything you see in the movies and nothing like it all at once. Um, your biggest enemy is boredom, and the biggest torture is watching the world go round and round without you. I used to sit... <clears throat> um, and I faced a highway at one point out of my prison cell. I could, I could see the highway off in the distance. And um, I used to try to count the headlights. And I just used to watch the world go on without me. And it was a very humbling experience because I had, I had always thought of myself as so important. And, uh, and in that moment, at least, I was not. I was on very few people's minds, all the people I grew up with, uh, all the women that I thought I had seduced and, and were so into me had moved on, um, and only a couple people really gave a shit. A couple people wrote letters, um, a couple people came and visited, I was very lucky, I had a strong core group of people, but it wasn't a lot. It was a very humbling, humbling experience, but I remembered that I didn't want to feel like that when I got out. I wanted to be something better. I didn't want to be what I was before, <clears throat> arrogant, and stupid, and reckless, and selfish. But I still wanted to be important. I wanted to make an impact on the world that was 
positive, and I wanted to try at least to tip the scales a little bit to undo some of what I've done. And I came to the conclusion that the only thing that I could possibly do to right the wrongs that I had done is to make the most of the rest of my time in prison, and then to get out and to live as good of a life as I possibly could in the hopes that I would maybe inspire some others to do the same. So eventually, the, uh, the timer ran out. I made it. I got out of uh, prison in 2013, 26 years old. <clears throat> I had never done anything on my own at this point except make it through prison. I didn't really know the first thing about holding a job, having a job, working hard. You know, all I really figured out in prison was um, that I liked to read and, um, and that I didn't want to be under anybody's thumb anymore. Having your freedom taken away, rightfully so, having your freedom taken away changed my value system. And, uh, and I'm very thankful and I'm very grateful for that because it made me appreciate life so much when I got out. I was so happy to have made it, and I was so grateful that I did have some people who cared about me and who helped me through and helped me land on my feet when I got out. So I got out, <clears throat> um, worked in the gym industry for a little while, been fired from every job I've ever had or have quit on bad terms, not a very good employee. Um, and I made that mistake a couple of times until one time, I was working as an assistant general manager at a 24-hour uh, fitness flagship location. I had the possibility that I could make six figures. Felt like I was doing something in the world. And um, I was two weeks in on the job, and some, some guy in a suit walks in and hands me a letter of termination saying that my criminal, my criminal past um, was not something that 24 hours supported and that I was terminated effective immediately. Uh, even though I had just been hired, even though I was doing phenomenal. And I remember in that moment never wanting to feel um, so dependent upon anything or anybody else ever again. So I set out, started personal training, um, <clears throat> did pretty well for myself. I moved back to New Jersey, and uh, I opened up my business uh, there. Did very, very well. Very, very quickly, I Got a huge book of clients. I was quote unquote successful, or so I thought, um, making good money, spending a lot of money, enjoying my life, and I was kind of getting blown off track just a little bit. Still really working on myself as an individual, but I stopped pushing the envelope. I stopped holding myself accountable to all the things that I had told myself that I was going to do. I told myself that I was going to volunteer. I told myself that I was going to uh, be a better son to my, my mother and, and be a better uh, cousin and be a better grandson. And, uh, and the world distracted me again. So blown off course and very thankful that eventually I was presented with the opportunity uh, to do something great and to inspire a lot of people. And that came in the form of the COVID-19 lockdowns in the state of New Jersey. When they came and told us that we couldn't open our business, my partner and I didn't like what we were being told, didn't sit right, didn't feel right, but we didn't know enough to confidently stay open. So we shut down our business, but we started paying attention. We paid attention to the science and the politics. Neither one made sense. Um, <clears throat> so we started to figure out, what do we do now? And um, we knew that what was going on was not only incorrect, but was morally wrong. We were watching the effects, even very early on, what it was having on people. And we saw it firsthand. Attila's Gym is a gym with a lot of people who come not just to exercise physically, but to keep themselves sane up here. And um, <clears throat> a lot of veterans, a lot of guys who struggle who have battled with addiction, um, and who use the gym as an anchor to keep them driven in the right direction and, um, and not be blown off course. And we were watching these people suffer, and we were watching other businesses fail. And 14 days, excuse me, 11 days in, we decided that 
we, had, we could no longer sit by idly and allow this to happen. We knew it was wrong. There wasn't a, a doubt in our minds that what was going on was not only um, hurting people, but it was criminal. So we decided we were going to reopen our gym. We didn't know what we were getting into. Back then, we just thought it was this governor that was out of control. We didn't realize that it was the entire system itself uh, that has been blown off course. Reopened our gym, caught the attention of Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson threw a can of gas uh, on our little fire and blew us up into the national spotlight, which also made the fight bigger. It made it more important. Um, it made it scarier. Because now every weapon in the arsenal of the entire state of New Jersey was pointed at us. Um, they were coming after us with everything. The situation escalated very quickly. What started out as citations that we were getting uh, turned into doors being locked on us on our own private property. <clears throat> turned into, uh, after we picked those and opened the gym back up, and the plan was very simple all along. We didn't have to have all the answers, but we made a choice, we stuck with it, and we weren't going to back down for anybody, no matter what the consequences, no matter what the sacrifice, um, because what was going on was wrong, and then we were going to stop it. They started messing with our plumbing. They, uh, they started arresting our members. They started fining us $15,000 a day every single day that we were open. Um, they threatened to arrest us. They came back to, uh, to lock the doors again, so we took the doors off, and we camped out inside of our gym for 44 days or 47 days and nights. They finally came in and arrested us. They boarded our doors up with plywood, although I don't know who thought that that was going to stop us, but the next day we came back and we kicked them in, turned the lights on, and opened the gym back up. Um, from there, it continued to escalate. We were robbed of $173,000 from our bank account. Uh, Santander Bank just said, uh, sorry, Governor Murphy told us to take this. Uh, we weren't charging our members. We were running off donations. And the fight kept going. And we stayed steadfast in what we set out to do. All said and done, the gym stayed open. We paid a huge price, but we didn't do it alone. Because when you do the right thing, the right people will support you. I started out as an obscure gym owner three years ago, and today I have a network of people who are powerful and important and influential and caring beyond anything that I ever thought that I would be a part of. Um, and it was all because we did the right thing, and we stepped up to take the shots um, for everybody. And we did so gladly. And they would do it a million times again, no matter what they did. So on the back end of this, you know, <clears throat> I started to get a lot of questions. <clears throat> As I was becoming this uh, figure for freedom, small business freedom and uh, traditional American constitutional values, uh, people started asking me questions. Men started asking me questions. Uh, you know, how do, I, how do I become a better man? How do, I, um, how do I have courage? How do I do all these things? And to be honest with you, I still don't know all the answers. But I started to ask myself as well, for the second time in my life, because I had done it once already. And I decided, <clears throat> I decided that it was not only apparent that there was a war being waged on all things good and masculine, um, but that it was an existential threat to the world that we live in today. And that it's a game of inches that has been being played for quite a long time by people that you'll never be able to stick a finger to or point out. Um, you can call them globalist interests, you can call them bankers, you can call them whatever. These people have been around for a very long time. And the game that is being played 
is that when you lose, they win. And we see it all the time. We see it in politics. It's not just a political thing, but we see it in politics all the time. Markets crash. Who loses? Everybody in the room. Who wins? The guys that have been playing the game behind the scenes the whole time. And <clears throat> the only way that they get this done is by making men whose fundamental job is to protect. By making men complacent, by making men mediocre, by making men soft, by making men fearful, by making men weak, by isolating men, and by demonizing them. Sounds like a grand conspiracy theory. But look around you. Look at co collectively, not individually, collectively. Look at modern man. Is that something that anybody would be proud to be a part of collectively? Is that a tribe that any of us can say that we're proud to be a part of? Modern man is overfed and undernourished. We're distracted. Um, many men don't have all of those fundamental questions that I had asked myself and that many other men have asked themselves, not enough, answered for themselves. Modern man today is given these prepackaged concepts of what kind of man you are, sports guy. So on Sundays, you watch sports. You, know, you, don't, you don't do anything else on Sunday, you watch sports, you hang out with the boys, you drink beer, boom, that's modern man number one. And there's another prepackage, and there's another prepackage, another prepackage. And all of these prepackaged ideas, right? The stupid dad, um, the frat boy, all of these things are fabricated. Um, they're a product of a society that has a propaganda machine um, that is constantly pumping ideas into the hearts and the minds of not only young men, but all men. And I was one of those. And I, looking back, I can remember um, my value system. I got it from somewhere else. I didn't get it from here. I didn't get it from other men with strong values um, because I never communicated these things with other men. I was never taught that men would do that. I was, I was taught that you, were, you would be tough and you would be rugged and you know, you, uh, you don't show your emotions and you don't, you know, you don't talk about anything except sports and, and girls and so on and so forth. Um, and I finally got to experience something different during all of this. I connected with a network of men that I am very, very proud to call my tribe. We're all over the place. Some of us are local. Some of us aren't, but they're all men who have similar values, but more importantly, have firm and immovable values. We're not all the same. Some of us are uh, more wholesome than others. Some of us are uh, a little more wild than others, but we all believe in a couple really important core values. And the one that's most important to me is the idea of freedom. Having been in prison for all that time made me appreciate it. And when I saw the world starting to turn away from it, um, I decided that I would do anything to protect it and that I would not accept defeat no matter what the cost. And if you would have asked me if I had the strength to do that five years ago, I would have said no. I would have said, you know, I'm just one guy. Just one guy. Can't make a difference. Um, but I stand before you here, um, having been one of the most influential people over the past two years, having been one of the most talked about people over the last two years. And I don't say that to brag. I don't say that to boast. I say that 
because I am no different than anybody in this audience, no different than anybody watching. There's nothing inherently special about me. There are no characteristics that I have that any other man doesn't have the capacity to develop. But they have to be developed. And the only way that they're developed is by conflict and overcoming. I've been very fortunate in the span of my 36 years um, that I've had to fight some battles, some of which are my own doing. <clears throat> um, they weren't always good, but I was able to make the best out of all of them, and I was able to grow and become a better man because of it. And I noticed that as I became a better man, as I held myself to a higher standard, my life got better. It got more interesting. It was filled with passion. It was filled with more memorable experiences. And eventually I came to the conclusion <clears throat> that we have five responsibilities as a man. We have a responsibility to ourselves, we have a responsibility to our family, particularly the women, children, and our elders. We have a responsibility to our community, be that at the local level or be that at the national level. <clears throat> we have a responsibility some sort of higher order. I'm not a particularly religious man, but I don't believe that <clears throat> this is all random. And even if it is, that's pretty fucking cool. And that you have a responsibility to respect that. And I think most importantly, as a man, you have a responsibility to the men who have come before you who have built the world that you live in today. You have a responsibility to protect that world. You have a responsibility to shape that world. Um, your grandfather and your grandfather's grandfather and your grandfather's grandfather's grandfather would be ashamed to watch you sit on the sidelines while the world carries on while the world goes in a direction that I think anybody can confidently say in here is not a great one right now. We have a responsibility to the great men who have come before us to protect what they've built and to carry on a legacy. And we've been handed what I think is an incredible opportunity to carry the torch. There's no doubt that there is a decline in society. There's a decline in the values. There's a decline in the quality. Um, but that doesn't mean that there always has to be. Um, I truly believe that that decline is because men have checked out collectively. That men have resigned to being a spectator, by being a consumer and not a creator. And that's because they've been told that they're not powerful. They've been told that they're just one man. They've been told that they don't matter. They've been told that they're a demon, whatever. We've all heard all the, <clears throat> all the nonsense. but that is unequivocally false. And I am living proof that you can make a difference beyond your wildest dreams. Uh, I am by no means the smartest man in this room. Um, I am by no means the hardest working. Again, there's absolutely nothing special about me, except that I made a choice that aligned with my values and that I was not willing to compromise for anybody or anything. Because of that, I've been surrounded by incredible opportunities. My life has gotten unfathomably better, and it's on track to continue that. So 
So what I leave you with is a call to action. You have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to yourself, to your family, to your community, to your country, uh, to your elders, to the people that have come before you and to some higher order to be the best man that you can possibly be. And now is the easiest time to do it. The pack is weak overall, and it doesn't take much to stand out at this point. And I think everybody here probably understands that, or else you wouldn't be here. Ask yourself those tough questions. Sit in silence, whatever you gotta do. Answer them, answer them truthfully, even if they scare you. And hold other men accountable. These people that are your friends, even if they aren't on the same page, bring them in. Bring them into the fold. You make the man next to you better, you'll get better. It's a positive feedback cycle. And what we're in right now is a negative feedback cycle. As I get lazy, the guy next to me gets lazier. At the end of the day, we are pack animals. Uh, and that's just how the pack dynamic works. You push, the guy next to you pushes. You get better together, you get stronger together, you conquer anything together. And if we can start with just one person, the impact that you will have will continue to grow. And I think that in a very, very short amount of time, we could see a very, very different country and a very, very different world. But it starts with each and every one of you. It starts today, it starts now. It doesn't get delayed. It doesn't get put off. It shouldn't be a fleeting thought. It should be a priority. That's all I have. So if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Any topic, doesn't matter. Go right ahead. So yeah, so it can be often be very tough, especially if you have like national news coming after you to close close a gym. And I mean, it, it obviously does take a lot of courage to be very confident in your and very firm in your decision to um, keep your gym open. Um, like, how do you get that type of courage to to really stick with that decision, not? Um, fold on on that um like a, a lot of i'm sure a lot of other when the men, heat comes what, what was that when the heat comes how do you how do you stay true yeah because a lot of other men I'm, I'm sure would like close their businesses i mean I, I i live um about two hours from boston and that whole city was like shut down yeah, yeah. well that's a really good question um and it's it's um i think it's a really important one <clears throat> You are going to face scrutiny no matter what you do. Um, and it tends to happen like this. The greater the move you make, the hotter the flame. But I can tell you this. It doesn't mean jack shit what these people say about you. It doesn't mean jack shit what they write about you. The only thing that should matter to you in terms of people's opinions are the opinions of the people that you love and the, the, the opinions of the people that you provide and protect, whether that be your family members, whether that be your best friend, whether that be anybody else who stands by your side and, and aligns with you in your value system. I think that <clears throat> the internet plays a large role in this. The, the voices of negativity uh, and, and hatred and all that get amplified because everybody's got a microphone these days. But if you take, take that out of the equation, take mass media and the internet out of the equation, if you were in my position, would you have opened the gym without any criticism? Probably. No. Probably not. I, 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 I mean, well, no, I, mean, I, I would say I, I, I probably would have opened it. If like, you weren't going to face any scrutiny. Gonna... Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, that was the decision, yeah. So why would you care about the scrutiny of people who you don't know, who aren't your members at your gym, who don't provide for your family, who don't care 
you would have lost everything, and these people would have applauded. They would have, they would have been happy that you lost everything. They would have said, oh, you know, well, we just had to do it for the greater good. Meanwhile, you're down and out on your ass. Everything that you built, your entire life's work, the way you feed your family. And these people also have the power to arrest you and put you back in, in prison. They sure do. They sure do. You have to look at the bigger picture, though. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't about a gym. The gym was the vehicle. It was about freedom. And if they can come close my gym, they can come do whatever they want to you. And they can take the next step, and they can take the next step. So at some point in your value system, you have to draw that line and say, you are not going to cross it, no matter what you do to me, no matter what you say to me, because this is, this is my perimeter. These are my people. This is what I protect. This is my stake. And no opinion is worth it letting anybody cross that line. No punishment is. You know, but you just have to be very realistic, I think. And um, with what we did, I think we realized a lot earlier than many people did the importance of what we were doing. You know, a lot of people thought, oh, it's just two weeks. You know, um, it's just, just businesses shut down. But look where we're at today. You know, what started, what started three years ago is still going on. Uh, people lost jobs over it. People did all these things over it. So it was important enough for us to draw that line in the sand. Not everybody's got the same line. That's okay. But you have to figure out what that perimeter is. Anybody else? Ian, thanks again. Um, Thank you. I'm just curious a little more about the ongoing saga. If if there's an end to it, if it's still yeah. ongoing, because um, as we talked a little bit last year, um, that's my old neighborhood too. I worked over there. I, I wasn't familiar with it at the time, but I'm just curious, has this national spectacle played out? Is it still ongoing in your life? Has there been uh, financial damage that's still haunting you? So um, all said, we did not charge members, but we were open for the entire two years um, until we got our business license back. So they had, one of the punishments they had done is they had stripped us of our business license. When we originally reopened, when, when there was quote unquote lockdowns, um, we weren't charging anybody because it wasn't about the money, it was about the principal. Um, we didn't want to charge people that weren't coming, so we said, hey, it's free, donate it if you want. Eventually, when they reopened New Jersey, they took our business license a week before and said, now, now you can't be in business, and that was, obviously designed to, to make us fail, so we just stayed open and we sold t-shirts. Uh, we sold t-shirts and we took donations for another year and a half or so, uh, until we just kept suing the township. We sued them, we lost, we sued them, we lost. We sued them, we lost, we sued them, we lost. All said, we've spent about $650,000 in legal bills that were funded entirely off of donations and t-shirt sales. Um, the mayor contacted our lawyer back in, in April, excuse me, in May, uh, and said, how long are these guys gonna keep this up for? And the, uh, the lawyer said, as long as they keep paying me, and they don't, they don't seem to have a shortage on fundraising. So uh, two days later, in the mail came our business license. So the mayor finally gave up, because of course, it wasn't the mayor's decision. The mayor was following orders. The mayor's a Democrat in a Democrat-run town and a Democrat-run state. Um, and he was towing the party line. The order came down from Governor Murphy, told us to take the business license. This guy probably didn't care. Um, and he could no longer justify the, uh, the legal expenses because it costs money to go to court, whether you're the state or not. And um, eventually said, I can't, I can't justify this anymore. Even, even the craziest of COVID Karens didn't care about Attilus anymore. Um, you know, everybody had, had moved on. <laughs> Everybody had moved on. So um, at that point, I was running for Congress. Um, I, I wound up running for Congress on the back end of this, which is a part of the story that I, I kind of forgot to talk about. But um, I, had, uh, I had gotten wrapped up in my, in my race. And um, we still had some things going on. But I ultimately sold my half of the business to my business partner. Um, and there are still some appeal processes going on. So they took all that money. They fined us $15,000 per day for X amount of days. They wound up confiscating 200,000 altogether. So there's an appeal process for those fines. That will probably drag on for at least another year and a half, if not more. Um, 
and then uh, a countersuit will follow. So it just gets to be a very slow process. And that's, that's what these people understand. They know whether it's big money either way, corporations, government, same thing. Um, they know that they can get away with bullshit because in order to stop them, it's going to take years and years and years. And they know that most people will never even depart on that journey because it's expensive, because it's tiresome, uh, and you're going to take a lot of punches along the way. So Attila's gym is open. Um, we've remained open all the way through. That was the ultimate goal. They never successfully shut us down ever. Um, and we're sort of just rocking and rolling, operating like a normal business. So, Awesome. It sounds a lot like uh, Jeff Younger's experience with the dragging on. And they just want to keep you fighting, yeah. Yeah, drain yeah. you. They know it's a 12-round fight. They know it's a rocky story. You'll knock them out in the end. You know, good will always prevail, but they know that most people aren't cut out for that. Um, whether they just don't have the resources, um, you know, which we were very fortunate at Attilus. There was a lot of businesses who tried to open who just didn't have the support. You know, because of the intensity of the story, you know, we were getting crazy punishments, but we also had an incredible network of people that supported us. So we were able to sort of go the distance. Um, and, and my former partner will continue to go the distance. We'll continue to fundraise and support, but it'll be a long journey until, until the, the end is done. But they try to discourage you rounds one through 11. They'll, they'll beat you down. They'll try to uh, drive you into poverty. They'll intimidate you. They'll write nasty articles about you. But you know, in the end, if you, can, if you can outlast those 11 rounds, round 12 is, is ultimately where the victory comes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, got one more. Ian, I'm just curious, what's the story behind the tattoo on your left arm? Uh, this, is, this is what, this one or this one? Uh, the lower one. Okay, so this is, uh, this is George Washington crossing the Delaware. So being a, a New Jersey native, I actually live right around, uh, not too far from George Washington's crossing. And to be honest, uh, these men have fascinated me for a long time. You know, our founding fathers, something that a lot of people don't realize, they think that they know, but they don't realize, a lot of these guys were like in their 20s. Um, and were living in this new land that was rough and rugged, uh, under the thumb of some, some radical tyrants. And, uh, and they said, fuck you, we're not doing this. Um, and they didn't have the resources, they didn't, they didn't have the organization, they didn't have the, uh, the structure, uh, they, didn't have, they didn't have what they needed to fight and they fought anyway. Uh, and they fought hard. And um, I just have a tremendous amount of respect. I think that's one of the greatest American stories ever told is uh, what these guys did um, to create a country that we live in today. And of course we have, uh, we, have we the people. That's, um, if I learned anything from the Attila story, <sighs> it's that the power of we the people is a, is a very real thing. You know, uh, when they took, I was telling this story last night, when they took $170,000 from our bank account, we walked, we walked in, granted we had everything else going on, you know, legal troubles, all this stuff, and you open up the computer and you have no money in your bank account. You got lawyers to pay, you got bills to pay, whatever, uh, and we didn't, all of a sudden it was zero. And, um, you know, I just remember going on to social media, that was like my broadcast network at the time, and I said, hey guys, they took all our money, zeroed us out, Gym's still open, see you guys later. And by the end of that week, we had $100,000 in t-shirt orders. Uh, I didn't ask, I didn't say a damn word other than we were open. And all these people from around the country and around the world, we sent shirts to 18 countries, decided they were gonna buy a t-shirt that day. Two t-shirts, three t-shirts, five t-shirts, hats, whatever. We didn't even have the inventory. Um, but nobody even cared. I mean, it took months to get all this stuff out. Nobody cared. They just wanted us to keep going. So, we the people is something that I, I truly believe, and that's one of, one of the core values I have. I think that we're stronger together. Um, and I think that you see a lot of division in this country. I think it's on purpose. Um, so that's something that always brings me back. And last part is the Liberty Bell. So I'm from Philadelphia. That's an iconic uh, American landmark and um, just along long lines with all my values. Thanks, guys.